welcome to my homestead and welcome to my channel. In this video, we're going to go over this article that I came across as I was doing that video about the four horsemen of the apocalypse, which I, I believe that that's kind of a, it's a misnomer, uh, simply because that term comes from other Christian churches. Uh, they don't have the same understanding that we do about seals and when uh, certain seals are open you have a horseman come out and it has to do with the first four thousand years of the earth's temporal existence but um as i was doing my research into that i came across this article this is by gerald n lund now he actually spoke uh to us on my mission uh during the zone conference and um He's the one that wrote uh, The Work in the Glory, right? Isn't that what it's called, The Work in the Glory? Um, he was a 70, and uh, this is an article from 1987, uh, December of the Ensign, okay? I haven't, I haven't read this. Uh, I just want to read it, because it seems like it's just chock full of really good things to keep in mind as we study the Second Coming. In this case, we're talking specifically about the Book of Revelation, which I really, really, really do think confuses a lot of people. And, and how couldn't it? Because it's full of uh, imagery, and I think uh, like a, a more ancient Jewish way of communicating certain ideas. We've talked about numbers, right? Uh, like a lot of people, they, they, they look at the measurement for the New Jerusalem, and what you come out with, if you're to take that as a literal me measurement, is literally a continent size cube that some believe are going to come and attach itself to the earth. And um, while I, I can't say for sure <laughs> that, <laughs> that, that that's not true, uh, I kind of doubt it. We, we learned in a, in a previous video from a BYU scholar that in ancient times, Jews, they're, they're all about numbers. And when you're trying to like amplify an idea in someone's mind, or you're trying to demonstrate how big something's going to be, or how important, or whatever, you take a number that represents a concept like the priesthood. So, for example, 12, and then you square it, and you get 144. And then if you want to like um, reinforce that idea even more, or show just how big uh, it's going to be in the last days, uh, then you times it by a thousand. Okay, so that that's like, according to that uh, BYU scholar, you'll have to go back and find that video that I did about the 144,000. But in that video, I think his last name is Draper. Is it Roger Draper? I'm not sure. But, uh, you know, some people, they, they don't know how to read the Book of Mormon. It's lost on them. They just kind of see th this, like, weird imagery of beasts and eyes and horsemen and uh, gigantic numbers, you know. And so, not knowing any, any better, sometimes you just kind of take it for face value. And it's like, oh, yeah, this makes sense to me. There's going to be a gigantic... <laughs> There's going to be a gigantic continent size cube that comes to the Earth, and that's going to be the New Jerusalem. Um, could you imagine, like, traveling on the elevators of the <laughs> thing if it had elevators? Uh, how, okay, hold on. I got to do this. How fast does an elevator, okay, how fast do elevators move? Okay, so about 100 feet per minute. Um, we're between 1.14 and 2.27 miles per hour. Okay, so let's look at the United States because that cube, it's not as big as the United States um, if you take the area size of like one of the sides. But um, let's just say that we are going from New York to Denver. No, let's go to Cheyenne because that's more more of a straight line because of I-80. So, because I think Cheyenne goes... Yeah, there's Cheyenne. So, let's do Cheyenne, Wyoming. And then let's do directions to New... Oops. New York City. Sorry, it's hard to type because the microphone's in front of me. I'm actually... I'm a good typer. Um... Okay, so if you're going, if you're going uh, by car, 
uh, that distance, you know, an average of like 65 miles an hour, uh, it's going to take you 27 hours. But if we're going uh, walking, because like an elevator pro. <laughs> <laughs> An elevator probably goes about the same speed as like walking, maybe a little bit faster. But uh, according to this, <laughs> okay. So if you're taking an elevator from the ground floor of New Jerusalem to the very top, um, it's probably going to take you. <laughs> Sorry. It's going to probably take you about 581 hours. Um, how many? <laughs> how many hours in a week? Uh, 100 or 168. So uh, let me pull up the calculator. Uh, 581 divided by 168. Uh, okay, so it's going to take you about uh, three and a half weeks uh, to take the elevator to get to the top floor. But um, the good news, it's only going to take half that time if you only have to go to like the middle floor. Um, so and then and then you have to remember that now I'm not I'm not trying to like make fun of anybody's intelligence but maybe consider some things that have you really like thought through this idea of a gigantic cube-sized structure building city I don't know I don't know if it would have levels I don't know whatever but if it had levels you have to think that each level is going to be about the size of a continent <laughs> so you know the first floor it's about the size of America maybe like half the size and then the second and third and fourth and fifth and sixth and then probably all the way up to like the one millionth floor that's like going past the stratosphere <laughs> up into space um that that's a lot of square footage uh so i don't know if, if it happens then it happens and we'll just have to accept that reality um but the thing about it is that if we do have a new jerusalem that comes in the form of a gigantic cube um that would it, by my estimates that would cover up the 24 temple complex in independence missouri um, unless like there's like a hole in the bottom to like make sure to incorporate <clears throat> the temple complex um, in other like temples across the land and stuff like that, you know. So just something to think about. You have to kind of like take things out to their logical conclusion and think, okay, is it more reasonable? Uh, does it seem more realistic that what's happening here is you have this ancient Jewish practice of using numbers to convey big ideas, the grandness of the last days and how that's going to be? Or is it more reasonable to think that a continent-sized cube is going to land on the United States and um, <clears throat> you know it's going to take you three and a half weeks to walk across it or take an elevator to the top and so on and so forth? So... Um, in that spirit, let's read this article called Seeing the Book of Revelation as a Book of Revelation by Gerald N. Lund. Okay, and I'll just go through reading it. I haven't read it yet. I'm going to comment as we go. <clears throat> no book, <clears throat> excuse me, no book in all scripture has stimulated more discussion, generated more, <laughs> more controversy, you don't say, and created more questions than the Book of Revelation. Many modern readers... Now, note that he's saying modern. Many modern readers find its imagery and symbolism strange and its message unclear. It isn't a great surprise, then, that so many often leave the book unread. Now, we we saw an example of this, the, the message being unclear, uh, when we were looking at the three different... Um, Christian church websites. I, I don't know exactly who they each one of them were, but they were three different uh, church websites, and they all they all had like a completely different uh, interpretation of the four horsemen, right? Uh, and I'm sure that there's like a billion more interpretations of what it means. It's not clear. If it was clear, everyone would mostly be on the same page, uh, but they're not. So. Anyway, the title of the book in Greek is Apocalypsis, from which we get its other common name, the Apocalypse. Apocalypsis is formed from two Greek words, apo, 
uh, a preposition denoting separation or removal, and calypto, a verb meaning to cover, hide, or veil. Apocalypsis, then, literally means removal of the veil or covering. That's interesting. Um, it's, yeah, and it's, it's a revelation, right? It's revealing something. Hence, its title in English, the Book of Revelation, or Uncovering or Unveiling. Uh, while many find the title to be ironic, <laughs> arguing that few books are more hidden or veiled, it is an appropriate one, for it truly reveals many things. Elder Bruce R. McConkie, in response to the question, are we expected to understand the book of Revelation? Answered, certainly. Why else did the Lord reveal it? The common notion that it deals with beasts and plagues and mysterious symbolisms that cannot be understood is just not true. If we apply ourselves with full purpose of heart, we can catch the vision of what the, what the ancient revelator recorded. And um, <clears throat> I have argued, I, I'm sure he's going to say this too later on, but I've argued if you're trying to understand it, okay, um, the, the, the spirit can obviously reveal things to you, right? I'm not going to put limit, limits on the spirit, but what, a good practice would be you, you read a chapter or you read a verse, you don't know what it's really saying. First, look at the chapter heading of the, of the chapter that you're reading. <clears throat> look at the footnotes. Uh, use something like the Scripture Citation Index and see who, like what general authorities have cited that scripture and how they used it. Look for Ensign articles. Look at student manuals. Um, there's all sorts of church publications that cover these things. Do that first before you go to other churches that have no idea of things like Joseph Smith translations, the Doctrine and Covenants that explains things in the book of Revelation exhaust those sources first, right? In fact, I don't I don't think you really need to go uh, to other churches to understand things. Uh, I, I really don't. If anything, I think you're going to get more confused, if, if anything else. Okay, continuing. Oh, oops, what, what just happened? Okay, sorry, I, I pushed a button. Um, okay, of all this, however... It is not meant to imply that the book of Revelation is simple or easily understood. From the great vision of Nephi, we gain significant insight into the book of Revelation. After seeing the birth and ministry of the Savior, Nephi was shown a series of future events, from the split of Lehi's descendants into two main groups, to the coming forth of the Book of Mormon and the restoration of the church. In other words, the vision, the vision of Nephi began in his own time and progressively moved forward to our own time. But just as, uh, just as he came to what would be future to us, Nephi was told not to write what he would see. The Lord explained to Nephi that another person, the Apostle John, had been ordained to write about these future events. Doesn't that tell us something about the significance of the book of Revelation for us? Many of this generation are anxious about the future and what it holds for us. From Nephi's vision, we learn that John's writings are primarily about that which is future to us. Now, um, I would say, you know, we talk about how the Book of Mormon was written specifically for us, and that's true. Um, I would also say that that's true of the Book of Revelation, because it is future to us. Um, I, well, some of it. I, I do tend to think that we, we've actually gone through some of what he's already seen. Uh, when we're talking about seals and stuff, and uh, this dispensation, the returning of the church from the wilderness, and um, stuff like that. So, okay, four keys to seeing the book of Revelation as a book of Revelation. Some portions of the scriptures are less easily understood than others. Many readers are used to fast-moving narratives, like the story of the sons of Mosiah in their mission to the Lamanites in Alma 17 through uh, chapters 17 through 26. The books of Isaiah and Revelation are not that kind of historical record, and church members who try to understand, try to read them as narratives have difficulty understanding them. So, uh, you can't really read it like a story, right? It's not so much a story. Like, there, there is, you know, story elements in it, but, um, 
you you have to you have to approach it differently. Um, it has symbols, right? Symbols are not stories. Symbols are things that you look at or you put in your mind and you kind of like think about their aspects and the different meanings of their shape or uh, in this case, if there's like imagery, you know, what does what do, what do eyes represent? You have beasts that are full of eyes. Uh, again, are they literally full of eyes? Um, Joseph Smith, he said, no, they're not literally full of eyes in the front and the back. It has to do with uh, their knowledge and so on and so forth. Uh, so, but that's a symbol. You know, you think about beast with eyes and you think, okay, what do eyes represent? And you, and you think deeply about things. It's not a story. You sit there and you look at this basically encoded information. And, and it's it's not necessarily easy to decode. It can be, but that's why we got to rely on church material. Joseph Smith has already said a lot about the book of Revelation. You can see what he has said in the teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith. You can use the scripture citation index to find it. Um, but just like this article, you can also look at the ensign and other things. Bruce Armour Conkey was an incredible um, scriptural scholar, uh, and he has a lot of really good insights on things. So um, I, I would be careful with like coming up with our own interpretations, like, hmm, I think I'm pretty clever, and that sounds like this. No, 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 no. Look first what someone in authority, an apostle, a general authority, a prophet, has said, and then base your thoughts around that. They, they are much more in authority to interpret these things. Um, okay, so the books of Isaiah and Revelation are not that kind of historical record, and church members who try to read them as, a narr as narratives have difficulty understanding them. Clearly, uh, one should not expect to read Revelation through once and fully comprehend it. The, the following four keys may help us understand the book of Revelation more fully. One, study, ponder, and pray about its message. Uh, again, th this takes effort, right? And, and that's, I, I'm not trying to put anybody down, you know, but when anything in life, in all aspects of life, if you want to learn something, you really have to do it. You have to, it takes time, it takes effort, and it's not necessarily easy, right? And so if all we do is just read the Book of Mormon, or all we do is read um, the New Testament, but we don't look at the Old Testament, we don't look at the Book of Revelation, we don't look at Isaiah, we don't look at things like that, you're kind of just, you're in a, a an easy groove. You're, you're just kind of... Um, you need to get out of that groove. Uh, now we're we're all progressing at our own uh, rate, so you know it, it depends on where you are in the gospel. It may be appropriate that you kind of stick to the lighter messages, uh, milk before meat. But once you once you get a pretty good feel uh, for the milk, and, and it's something that you always have to practice and go back to your whole life. It's not just like you master the. Uh, easier things to understand, uh, move on and start to dig a little bit deeper. Um, <clears throat> and it takes time. It's not easy. So it's going to take some effort. Okay, so number two. <clears throat> okay, number two. Look at this. Use Latter-day Revelation to expand our understanding of the book. Use Latter-day Revelation Listen to what prophets have said. And specifically, the book of Revelation comes up in Scripture. It comes up in the Book of Mormon. It comes up in the Doctrine and Covenants. Uh, so it comes up in Scripture. It also Joseph Smith has also received revelation about it, and it's in the, the teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith. Uh, number three, explore its symbolic imagery. Symbolism. Not literalism. Symbolism. Number four, study its chronological structure. Key number one, study, ponder, and pray. Diligent study, careful thought, 
and inspiration can help make the apocalypse clearer. The Lord apparently ca uh, couched the language of the book in such a way that only they who paid the price in diligent, prayerful study would come to understand it. So it's not, I guess one way of saying that, it's not just for your amusement, it's not entertainment, it's not, um, it's, like, it's, it's serious, it, it's a big deal. Put in the time, put in the effort, and then it'll be revealed to you. Um, as the Lord told John, quote, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith. Revelation 2, 7, the theme is repeated six times in chapters 2 and 3. Two kinds of effort, uh, two kinds of effort prove to be especially helpful in understanding Revelation. The first and perhaps most important effort is to heed the promptings of the Spirit as we study the Revelation of John. Quote, we must always remember that prophecy, visions, and revelations come by the power of the Holy Ghost and can only be understood in the fullness of and perfection by the power of that same spirit. That's from McConkie, Ensign, September 1975, page 86. As we study and ponder, we should pray for understanding and listen to the voice of the Spirit as it speaks in our minds and in our hearts. Peter said that, quote, no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. And you guys, oh my gosh, I, I see so much I see so much of that. People that um, think that they're really clever, that it, it's almost like sometimes the feeling that I get is like, you know, when you give kids like a, 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 maybe like a, a page to color, like think about like preschool or kindergarten, you give kids uh, a page, uh, a paper to color. It, each page has the same picture. And then everybody, you know, they all color it and everyone does it in their own way. And then afterwards, it's like, oh, how did you do? Oh, you you chose yellow and green. That's really good. What about you? Oh, I like what you did there. You outlined and you did this and that. And, you know, people, you have the kids that come up and be like, look what I did. That's not That's not how reality works. That's not how the gospel works. You can't just like go off, come up with uh, your own interpretation, and then like try and pass it off as like, aren't I so smart? Or, you know, I figured out the secret code. You know, we got to be careful with that. Are you, are you um, actually presenting what you actually believe, or are you presenting your cleverness and how smart you are or how much insight you have? Um, does your quote-unquote interpretation, does it mesh with what prophets say? Uh, have they already said similar things? Because you're probably not going to come up with anything that would contradict uh, what prophets and apostles and general authorities say. So, I just I think we got to be really careful uh, when we're talking to others. Certainly, don't teach it as though it's doctrine. Uh, just be like, you know what? This is my best understanding. Uh, I could be wrong about this. Um, this is my speculation. And there's nothing wrong with speculating. Obviously, you're you're trying to like learn. You're trying to like figure things out. It's fine. But just if you know that you don't really know, then don't try and pass it off as though it's something that is truth. Okay, uh, moving on. But came as prophets, quote, were moved by the Holy Ghost. When the Holy Spirit becomes our confirming guide, we can uh, come to better understand the revelation John received. A second important way by which we pay the price is acquiring a general gospel knowledge. John did not write Revelation for the non-member or even the investigator. Okay, so this is more meat than it is milk. Uh, he wrote for the saints and assumed that his readers would have a good knowledge of gospel principles, the plan of salvation, the scriptures, and scriptural symbols. Uh, he often mentions things in passing, and it is clear he assumes his readers will know them. For example, in Revelation 19.13, he describes Christ at his second coming, mentioning that, quote, he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. This may puzzle those who picture him clothed in glorious white. Glorious white. Nevertheless, it is in perfect agreement with other scripture that tell us that the Savior's apparel will be red at his coming. 
The, broad, the broader our knowledge of, of the gospel in the scriptures, the plainer the book of Revelation becomes. Yeah, definitely. Because you start to see, it's like, the book of Revelation is not um, separated from the rest of scripture as far as like, it's not like it breaks the rules of other scriptures. It's in accordance. Now, it's separate as far as like, it's deeper it's it's separate in that sense, but it still meshes with the rest of scripture. So if you're if you're seeing like contradictions or weird, really far out there things that don't really go along with what you've seen the Lord do other places in other uh, periods of time, then maybe you gotta step back and kind of rethink your interpretation. Um Okay, key number two, use Latter-day Revelation. <clears throat> this is huge. Latter-day Saints have a distinct advantage over the rest of the Christian world because modern prophets have revealed much that directly helps us interpret the mysteries revealed in the Apocalypse. Here are four primary sources of help. Specific examples are given in the accompanying chart. Okay, Latter-day Revelation in the Book of Revelation. Okay, so we in the first column, we have Latter-day Revelation. Column number two, examples of how Latter-day Revelation helps us better understand the Book of Revelation. Uh, the third column is Book of Revelation references. And then the fourth column is Latter-day Revelation references. So, okay. Latter-day Revelation. DNC is 77. I still haven't finished my series. I still have a few more <clears throat> verses to go. I'm going to continue with that in the next few videos. <clears throat> Excuse me. But what we're doing is we're going through DNC 77, which is the question and answer section about the book of Revelation. And I'm looking up in the scripture citation index uh, every time that a verse from section 77 is used by a general authority in general conference or Joseph Smith himself. Um, just to see what they say about it, how they talk about it, how they use it, why they're referencing it. Column two, Doctrine and Covenant 77 gives the meaning of the sealed book and the opening of its seals. That's something that always throws people off. Uh, other Christian churches have no idea of our belief about this. They have completely different beliefs about it. And that's in Revelation 5, 1 through 5, and then talked about in DNC 77, uh, 6 through 7. We've already done this video, so you can go back and watch that if you like. Um, <clears throat> and then also in DNC 77, you have the four angels mentioned in Revelation 7, uh, are angels of the restoration. And the restoration, that's a concept that other Christian churches do not have. Uh, that's Revelation 7.1 in DNC 77.8. Um, also, all the events of chapter 9 immediately precede the second coming of Christ. Revelation 9, DNC 77.13. Okay, Joseph, here you go. Yeah, see, this is, an, this is an awesome, this is an awesome article. Joseph Smith Revelation. Okay, so this is the next uh, help. The seven stars in the Savior's hand are actually leaders of the seven churches, meaning those like seven original churches that were uh, basically in modern day Turkey is where they were. Revelation 1, 16 and 20, and then Joseph Smith translation, Revelation 1, 20. The imagery of seven <clears throat> associate, associated with the lamb is changed to 12, suggesting the role of 12 apostles in the work of Christ. Look at that. A number that's changed. 7 to 12. That's Joseph Smith translation, Revelation 5-6. <clears throat> Sorry. The woman and the man-child represent the kingdom of God and the church of Christ. Uh, and, it, and it talks about that in uh, Joseph Smith translation, Revelation 12, 3, and 7. And in that same chapter, by the way, you have one of these three and a half periods, three and a half year periods, which people will try and say is like part of the tribulation period. But guess what? The Joseph Smith translation, it changes days to years. Um, so in other words, not three and a half years, but like more than a thousand years. 
So that's like a huge difference. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so if you're going to other Christian churches and you're looking at their interpretation of that quote unquote three and a half year period, Joseph Smith says it's not a three and a half year period. It's like a super long time. And it represents the apostasy of the church. Okay. Before the restoration. That's what it that's what it's talking about. When you're talking about three and a half years, that's usually associated with a time of apostasy. And in this case, uh, having it changed to, from days to years, it's uh, referring to the fact that it's a really, really long apostasy. And it was. Okay. The beast of Revelation 13 is in the likeness of the kingdoms of Earth. Um, Joseph Smith translation 13.1. And uh, you guys, we've done a video about that, about beasts, right? Uh, the book of Daniel in the book of Revelation, they're like companion uh, books of scripture. They go together. And in the book of Revelation, you have two sets of beasts. You have four beasts that are in the presence of God. And Joseph Smith said that they are literal individual uh, beasts. They're not members of the first presidency. They're not Christ. They're not whatever. They're, they're just four um, worthy beasts, like actual beasts that are there. Uh, you can go back and watch that video. So you have that set of beasts that are in heaven with the Lord. And then you have the imagery that kind of comes back from the book of Daniel it shows up again in the book of Revelation and like just like it's saying here those images of beasts they're not actual beasts in this case they're images that uh, represent the kingdoms it's basically the same kingdoms that uh, Daniel saw but instead of being separate this time they're like all together in one body so it's like a beast that has like the different heads of the original beasts of the book of Daniel which makes sense because right now what we have uh, with like the world powers the, the kingdoms of the world we have uh, the remnants of all those different kingdoms of Babylon Persia uh, the Median Empire, Greece, Rome. So it's like all together. It's, it's basically all mixed in together. Um, so anyway, uh, now there's another source, other Latter-day Scripture. Uh, the Sea of Glass, John saw, represents the Earth in its celestialized state. So that's after the millennium. The Earth will be uh, like a huge Urim and Thummim, and the Lord and its the Lord and to the the inhabitants of the Earth. And that's talked about in uh, Revelation 4, 6, but it's also talked about in DNC 130, 7 through 9. So here is a modern day scripture that expands uh, and explains and expounds this idea. Uh, the white stone mentioned by John is a personal Urim and Thummim given to each individual. Uh, you find that in Revelation 2, 17, but it's also explained um, in DNC 130, 10 through 11. The iron rod mentioned in the vision in the vision is the word of God. Uh, that's in Revelation 2, 27 and 12, 5. And then, of course, we learn in 1 Nephi 11, 25, the, 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 the iron rod is the word of God. Okay, Mount Zion, on which the Lamb will stand with 144,000, refers to the New Jerusalem. And we've done videos about this, that uh, there's there's people that think that this 144,000 is like, um, they're basically like super missionaries. They're going to be translated, so they're going to be, be able to go out into the... I don't know, the war zones, or they're not going to be affected by famine or pestilence or disease. And we, we've we gone into that, and that's that's not what it is, according to Joseph Smith. But go watch that video. It was part of the, the series that I'm doing on Section 77. Um, this has to do mostly with people working in the temple um, and other people doing, doing the work of the Lord, bringing people to exaltation. Uh, so anyway, Revelation 14.1, and then it's talked about in DNC 84.2. Uh, the woman fleeing, in, fleeing to the wilderness is the church during the great apostasy. Talked about in Revelation 12.6 and also DNC 86.3. And again, this is a concept that they don't have. They do, they do I've noticed that they do 
uh, correctly identify the woman as the church. Um, but again, they do not have a concept of great apostasy. What they call, what we call the great apostasy, they call the church age, and they believe that this has not happened yet. They think that the woman fleeing into the wilderness. I'm not saying all of them, but I've seen a bunch of them believe that this is referring to rapture, that that God's going to rapture the church to escape the judgments, and that, and that this is something that has not happened yet. Well, <clears throat> what we believe is that this is the original church and the original kingdom that was born when Christ came the first time, but because of rebellion, it was taken off the earth, or in other, word, in other words, the woman, the church, fled with the child into a place that God had, pre had prepared, and then she comes back 1,260 years later, which I don't think is a literal number. It's just referring to the fact that there's a great apostasy. It's symbolic. Because like I said, three and a half to Jewish people, that, re that represents like only half of creation. It represents... Um, Kind of like disgust, like um, you know, something that's only half complete or or apostasy, right? So, okay, now you can also look at the writings and sermons of the prophets, and specifically, we've been going over the teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith, found on the Scripture Citation Index. It says here, the prophet Joseph Smith's sermon on the meaning of the beast in Revelation helps us uh, helps us with several passages, and. We have gone over this. In fact, I just explained it. The the two sets of beasts. The four that are in the presence of God, that John saw heaven. He saw the presence of the Lord. He saw the four beasts that were there. They talked to him. They were actual um, beings. Whereas the beasts later on uh, are talking about the kingdoms of the earth, not literal beasts. And as you can see here, he's referencing... Teachings of the Prophet Joseph Smith. So you can go to the, the Scripture Citation Index and read that there. It's probably in other places as well. Okay, Elder Bruce R. McConkie gave seven keys for interpreting the book of Revelation and numerous suggestions on how to better understand it. And then he, re he references um, understanding the book of Revelation and sign September 1975. Ooh, you know what? We're going to have to cover that one too. Okay, I'm going to have to make a note of that. We're going to have to look that up and read it. Okay, and that's the end of that chart. Okay, number one, Doctrine and Covenants 77. This is perhaps the single most important commentary we have about the book of Revelation. On March 1st, 1832, the prophet recorded, quote, about the 1st of March in connection with the translation of the scriptures, i.e., work on the Joseph Smith translation, I received the following explanation of the revelation of St. John. Oh, that's interesting. So it's almost like section 77. It's almost, it's almost like that is like a big Joseph Smith translation. It's not, it's in question and answer form, but <clears throat> it's uh, related because he was doing it at that time. Okay. In this section, 15 questions about the apocalypse were asked and answered. Some may wish that there had been many more questions answered, yes, but the 15 we have are sufficient for an understanding of the book. Indeed, these 15 questions that make up section 77 serve as a key to the book of Revelation. As Hiram M. Smith and <clears throat> Jane, Jan? Jane M. Shodal pointed out, quote, this revelation is not a complete interpretation of the book. It is a key and that's in italics. <clears throat> Sorry. As, as Champollion, by the key furnished in the brief test on the Rosetta Stone, was able to open the secrets of Egyptian hieroglyphics, so the Bible student should be able to read the Apocalypse with a better understanding of it by the aid of this key. Uh, number two, Joseph Smith's translation changes made in the book of Revelation. The prophet made relatively few changes in the book of Revelation, but the ones he did make are critical and help us gain understanding where otherwise we would be in the dark. And like I said, the, the changing of <clears throat> 1,260 days, uh, changing that from days to years, th that's a pretty critical change. And um, it's something that other, other Christians they don't know about. Number three, other Latter-day Scripture. 
numerous books in the Book of Mormon, um, sorry, numerous verses in the Book of Mormon and the Doctrine and Covenants aid our understanding of the Apocalypse. In some cases, the direct interpretation for a symbol in Revelation is given in one of the, of the works of modern scripture. Okay, so look at other look at other books and see if they explain what a symbol is and then see if that symbol is in the book of revelation number 4 writings and sermons of latter day prophets while there are not a large number of examples in this category, a number of statements by the brethren provide a better understanding of the apocalypse. Examples are on the chart at the left. Okay, <clears throat> key number three. Explore the symbolic imagery of the book. There's no question about the importance of understanding symbolism in the scriptures. But in a study of the book of Revelation, the interpretation of symbols becomes essential. The apocalypse was uh, painted with a symbolic brush. <clears throat> Gosh, sorry, there's something in my throat. And I don't have a, hold on, I do have a drink, hold on. <clears throat> Sorry. Okay. The apocalypse was painted with a symbolic brush. The palette was filled with metaphors, similes, symbols, and images, which require that we study it with those in mind. The following suggestions may prove helpful in correctly interpreting the symbolic imagery of the apocalypse. Number one. Remember that Hebrew imagery is different in many ways from the imagery we are used to. Though the Western mind also uses imagery and symbolism, we tend to make our figurative language more <clears throat> concrete, specific, and aesthetically attractive. On the other hand, the Hebrews were concerned not so much with the overall beauty uh, the image uh, of the image as they were with whether it accurately portrayed spiritual realities. Because of this, we sometimes find John's imagery to be jarring and even bizarre. An excellent example uh, is his description of the one like unto the Son of Man. As he describes the figure clothed in full-length robe, the whiteness of his being, the eyes like a flame of fire, uh, the typical Western reader begins to build an image of the Savior in his mind, then suddenly comes comes. <clears throat> then suddenly comes the phrase, and out of his mouth went a sharp, went a sharp two-edged sword. Our tendency is to try to add that image literally to our mental picture, and we end up with a disturbing portrait. <laughs> what, what's wrong with a sword coming out of a person's mouth? Uh, that's beautiful. Um, See, uh, this, is, this is a big problem right here. We are too, sometimes we are too, um, too, too wrapped up in our current environment and setting in which we have been placed. Most of us are in the West. Uh, most of the, my audience were in the West. Um, we definitely don't have very much ancient experience, I, I assume, uh, you know, uh, if you do, then let me know. Um, so you can't just like I, I feel like a big problem a lot of times is uh, we we assume that everything was written specifically for us, um, and even though the Book of Revelation was, uh, he was using his tools, uh, his understanding of the time to try and convey ideas. So we can't just like gloss over that fact. We can't just be like, oh yeah, it's pretty clear here. It's clear. No, 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 no. It, you're thinking with a modern Western mind. You have to, you have to understand how he was talking with an ancient Jewish mind. Then you can understand what he is trying to communicate. Okay, a Hebrew, on the other hand, might respond something like this. Of course, there is no actual sword coming out of his mouth, but what does come out of the mouth of a man? Words. But this is not just any man. This is the son of man. 
so out of his mouth comes the truth, the gospel, the word of God. The double-edged sword is an excellent symbol of the word or the gospel. It cuts through error, uh, pierces the heart, cleaves ignorance. Okay. In fact, the comparison of the word of God to a two-edged sword is frequent in Scripture. See Hebrews 4.12, D&C 6.2. We must therefore analyze each element of the image and ask the question, what spiritual truth was this meant to portray? What spiritual, not literal, what spiritual truth was this meant to portray? And you guys, we live in the information age and my favorite tool, you know what my favorite tool is on this channel, is the scripture citation index. So if you were reading the book of, uh, of Revelation and you came across this scripture talking about a sharp two-edged sword coming out of his mouth, uh, you could go to the scripture citation index and you can look up sword or two-edged sword and see where else that shows up in scripture. And then you might get some insight into what he's actually saying. So, that it, again, it's not easy. It requires work. But once you do the work, then you'll get the understanding. Um, okay, number two. Do the scriptures themselves give us the interpretation of the symbol? Joseph Smith said, quote, I make this broad declaration that whenever God gives a vision of an image or beast or figure of any kind, he always holds himself responsible to give a revelation or interpretation of the meaning thereof. Don't be afraid of being damned for not knowing the meaning of a vision or figure if God has not given a revelation or interpretation of the subject. And uh, again, there are many, many people that uh, still do this. They try and like figure out uh, different things when there, there's not a clear interpretation. Um, so we, we just got to be careful with that. It's okay. It's okay to wonder, to speculate, but just like don't become rigid in your beliefs if there's not an interpretation of what you're talking about. Okay. In many cases, we have no excuse for not understanding the divine imagery revealed to John, for the Lord has clearly specified how the symbols are to be interpreted. Sometimes the Lord gives the key in the same context as the symbol itself. Other times, he explains its significance later in the vision. Often, he provides the key somewhere else in the standard works. Here are some examples in which the context gives the interpretation. The seven golden candlesticks are the seven churches. <laughs> so there it is. Uh, the golden vials full of odors, incense, uh, are the prayers of the saints. So this is all coming from uh, Revelation chapter 1, Revelation chapter 5. In Revelation 12, the great red dragon is that old serpent called the devil and Satan. That, okay, uh, The many waters upon which the horse sits are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. That's in Revelation 17. Uh, the fine linen, clean and white, is the righteousness of the saints. That's in Revelation 19. Here are a few examples in which the interpretation is given elsewhere in Revelation. Uh, the morning star in Revelation 2.28 is Jesus Christ, Revelation 22.16. The seven heads of the beasts are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth and seven kings. Uh, here are several examples in which the interpretation is given elsewhere in Scripture. The tree of life, in Revelation 2.7, whose fruit the faithful may eat, is the love of God, 1 Nephi 11.25. Michael, Revelation 12.7, is Adam, D&C 107.54. Babylon, or the mother of harlots and abominations, mentioned in Revelation 14, 16, and 17, is a symbol of the great and abominable church founded by the devil and of spiritual wickedness, 1 Nephi 14, 3 and 10, DNC 86, DNC 133. Uh, number three, does the nature of the symbol give insights into its meaning? The peoples of the ancient Middle East loved imagery and figurative language. They saw spiritual parallels in the natural characteristics of animals, objects, and 
natural events around them. Thus, their choice of symbols was not arbitrary or capricious. The nature or characteristics of the item led to its use as a symbol. If we examine the symbol, pondering why the ancients chose it to represent symbolic truths, we often find important insights into its meaning. For example, trumpets were used anciently to sound an alarm, signal for battle, or announce the arrival of royalty. The sounding of a trumpet, therefore, heralds or announces something highly significant. This explains why the seven angels sound trumpets as each new judgment of the seventh seal is shown forth. And uh, we've also talked about um, trumpets, their history in the scriptures, how the first time you hear a trumpet is at Mount Sinai, and uh, it's used in the Jewish feast days, specifically Rosh Hashanah, and um, I believe Yom Kippur as well. Um by the way, Rosh Hashanah, that's the Feast of Trumpets, so of course you have the shofar, which is the ram's horn. Okay, the candlestick is not a source of light, uh, but a holder of light. Since the Church of Jesus Christ is not the actual source of truth, but merely holds up Jesus Christ, uh, the true light of the world for all to see, the candlestick provides a meaningful representation of the Church. Another example is the image of keys. Anciently, <clears throat> anciently locks were hand-carved from wood or hand-forged from metal, and they were large, bulky, and expensive. Locks were therefore used to protect only very valuable treasure or stores. Because the common people rarely owned anything valuable enough to lock up, keys usually were held only by the wealthy and powerful, or entrusted to them to or entrusted them to stewards. Keys were typically worn around the neck on a chain, so if people saw a man on a street wearing a key, they could rightly assume that he was a man of power and authority. In this manner, keys came to be a symbol, not only of control over something, but of invested power and authority. Again and again, we find that pondering the natural characteristics of an item chosen as a symbol leads to greater understanding of scriptural imagery. We should constantly ask, why would this thing be used symbolically? Yeah, that is a great insight. You, you should probably ask that for everything. Uh, okay, what is this? What does this mean? Why is it being used in this instance? Um, okay, key number four, study the chronological structure of the book. Understanding a scriptural passage, passage's basic structure how it is organized, and the purposes for which it was written will enhance understanding of the scripture itself. For example, the Book of Mormon follows a basic historical narrative that pauses in places to present uh, selected sermons. However, the, cr the chronological order of the narrative is not entirely consistent. For example, the Words of Mormon, written about AD 385, are inserted between writings completed more than 500 years earlier, and, Mor <clears throat> and Moroni, who writes around AD 400, inserts the Book of Ether after uh, the record of the fall of the Nephites, even though the record precedes that fall by 2,600 years. These seeming, these seeming inconsistencies become perfectly logical if we understand that Mormon was writing an abridgment of many records and that his son, Moroni, decided to add the account of the Jaredites after his father gave the record to him. The New Testament, on the other hand, was a completely different organizational structure. There is no uh, grand unifying cr chronological development. It is a series of short, independent works and letters. We would be foolish to look for a narrative flowing through the, the New Testament. Thus, knowing the basic organizational structure of a work is vital to a better understanding of its contents. This is especially true in the book of Revelation. The, uh, the apocalypse can be outlined in four main divisions. One, the introduction in Revelation 1. Two, the seven individual letters to the churches. Revelation uh, 2 to three, two and 3. 3. The vision of things to come. Revelation 4 through uh, chapter 4 through 22, verse 5. Uh, so chapters 4 through chapter 22, uh, ending at verse 5 of 22. And 4, the conclusion. Revelation 22, uh, verses 6 through 21. 
Since the book records the vision, or perhaps series of visions, of things to come, which constitutes not only uh, the majority of the book, but also the bulk, the bulk of the difficult passages, we shall concentrate on the third division. When John saw a door open in heaven and heard a voice telling him, Come up hither, he was also told that he would be shown things which must be hereafter. The prophet Joseph Smith likewise said, quote, The things which John saw had no allusion to the scenes of the days of Adam, Enoch, Abraham, or Jesus, only, only so far as it plainly as is plainly represented by John and clearly set forth by him. John saw saw that only which was lying in futurity and which was shortly to come to pass. Uh, that's Teachings, page 289. Um, well, I would say with the exception of the four horsemen, because that came before. That's as the, the seals are being opened, but that's probably the only that's probably the only case where it's really talking about uh, things of the past. Um, the great vision of futurity shown to John opens with God on the throne of heaven, surrounded by numerous beings singing uh, praise to him. And this is where you first meet the, the four beasts. The father has a book in his right hand that is sealed with seven seals. No one is worthy to open the book except the Lamb of, the Lamb of God. Since the rest of the vision is what John sees as each of the seven seals are open, understanding the symbolism of the book and the seals is critical to understanding the book of Revelation. Fortunately, uh, these were two of the topics addressed by the prophet in Doctrine and Covenants 77, verses 6 through 7. What are we to understand uh, by the book which John saw, which was sealed on the back with seven seals? Answer. We are to understand that it contains the revealed will, mysteries, and works of God, the hidden things of his economy concerning this earth during the 7,000 years of, of its continuance or its temporal existence. Question. What are we to understand by the seven seals with which it was sealed? Answer. We are to understand that the first seal contains the things of the first thousand years, and the second also of the second thousand years, and so on until the seventh. With this information, we can see how the book is structured and where the primary emphasis lies. For example, if we know the white horse and the man with a bow goes forth to conquer um, in Revelation 6, 1 through 2, as part of the first seal or first thousand years, we will not look for some interpretation uh, from our own time. Now, see, uh, we talked about this in uh, uh, two videos ago when we were talking about the horses. There, there's people, it, there's people in our church that believe that the four horsemen are yet to come, or that, or that they um, are. It's like currently happening, but it's not. It, it has to do with the first four thousand years of Earth's temporal existence. Um, it, it says it. It says it right here. It says it in because it says in Doctrine and Covenants that you know first seal is the first thousand years, second seal is the second thousand years, so on and so forth. And um, anyway, so you you have a bunch of different Christian churches that view these horsemen as uh, coming at the end, going along with like the judgments. You know the 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 seven angels that are blowing their trumpets. Um, there's going to be the four horsemen. All as well. But no, it, it's it's already happened. Elder Bruce R. McConkey uh, suggested that this was a representation of Enoch and the Zion he established, uh, talking about the white horse. And uh, talking about the white horse, we learned in, in that previous video that I did, that it had to do with Enoch's uh, wars. That there was war that he engaged in, uh, where you had the people of God that were fighting their enemies. And, and Enoch, of course, was um, he he succeeded. He won. He he conquered them. Um, knowing the chron knowing the chronology of the seals helps us see that John's emphasis is primarily the future. He spends only two verses a, uh, a piece on each of the first four seals or periods of a thousand years each. Obviously, that constitutes the briefest of historical highlights. For the fifth seal, which was very likely the time in which God him uh, John himself lived. The apostle took only three verses. See Revelation 5, 1 through 11. <clears throat> the entire vision from beginning to end takes 
317 verses, and yet John spends only 11 verses, or about 3.5% on the first 5,000 years of history, which is about 71% of the Earth's total 7,000 years of recorded history. Without a doubt, the vast majority of the vision focuses on things which must be hereafter, quote-unquote. Furthermore, on closer examination, we see that the focus is even more limited than that. The account of the opening of the seventh seal begins in Revelation 8, verse 1, and yet the account of the second coming in the millennium do not occur until chapters 19 and 20. Okay, so uh, the seventh seal, okay, that takes up uh, eight chapters, okay? So that's, uh, relatively speaking, that's like a very, very big portion of the book is the seventh seal. The millennium itself is treated only within only seven verses. See Revelation 20, verses 1 through 7. By far, the largest portion of the book describes the events that immediately precede the second coming of the Savior. That's interesting. The basic structure of the vision is chronological. After seeing the Father and the Son in heaven, uh, in chapters 4 and 5, the vision of the history and destiny of the world begin to unfold for John. He, ser he sees the first five seals, <clears throat> or the first 5,000 years of history, in rapid fire, encapsul encapsulated form. Then he sees the opening of the sixth seal, which includes the restoration of the gospel. See Revelation <clears throat> chapter 12, verse 6 through 7. Uh, verse 17. After that, John sees the seventh period of a thousand years with a great judgment poured out upon the earth, including Armageddon, uh, which eventually which eventually led to the, uh, the utter overthrow of Babylon and make way for the second coming of him who is king of kings and lord of lords. Immediately following that, John sees Satan bound and Christ reigning for a thousand years, uh, a last great battle between the forces of righteousness and evil, and uh, the final judgment, <clears throat> excuse me, finally, a new heaven and a new earth are brought forth. And this is at, at the end. Uh, teaching interludes. Not everything fits quite so neatly into this chronological line, however. Uh, for example, the war in heaven, which took place before the earth was formed, is shown among the events of the seventh seal. That's in Revelation 12. Revelation 12 uh, it has to do, like I said, it's talking about the woman and the child, which is the kingdom of God. And um, it talks about the great apostasy. But then after that, it talks about how the dragon or Satan cast down uh, a third part of the stars of heaven, uh, which is a callback to the pre-existence. Uh, how he he had a third part of the... of. Um, of us, you know, uh, follow him. Uh, also among the events of the seventh seal is a passage that Latter-day Saints have interpreted to refer to the restoration of the gospel, which actually took place in the sixth seal. How do we explain these seeming anachronisms? As one studies the book, it becomes clear that there are places in the chronological flow where the Lord pauses to teach us important information before moving on. A teacher may do this as he moves through a lecture, pausing in his logical development to say, Now, before we go further, I need to make sure you understand something. Such teaching interludes seem to apply to John's visions. For example, 1. The joy of those who are saved. Before launching into a grim description of the judgments, John sees an innumerable company of the righteous, a powerful reminder that not all on earth will be wicked and will suffer God's judgments. Number 2. The little book, Interlude. In the midst of a vivid description of the great battle of Armageddon, there is another pause. An angel gives John a little book to eat, uh, which he, which we learn is a symbol of John's ministry. Since the apostle was translated and was to live through all the events he saw, the Lord seems to pause to show him what part uh, he will have in all of it. Three, the kingdoms the kingdoms interlude, Revelation twelve through fourteen. This is the longest and perhaps the most difficult interlude to understand. The three chapters seem to comprise an overview of mankind's history from the premortal existence to the second coming, as it pertains to the kingdoms of the kingdoms of the Lamb, Jesus Christ, and the dragon, Satan. When John hears that the kingdoms of the world are to become 
the kingdoms of Christ, it is as though the Lord stops to teach more about these two different classes of kingdoms. First, we see the woman and the man-child whom she gives birth, when we see a great red dragon ready to devour the child. In verse 7 of the Joseph Smith translation, we learn that the woman is the church of God, who brings forth the kingdom of God in Christ. We also see that Satan's opposition to the work of Christ's kingdom is um, implacable, and in fact began in the war in heaven before the earth was formed. Uh, we then learn that Satan's kingdom also has two aspects. The beast that has seven heads and ten horns, and the beast that causes men to worship the first beast, uh, sorry, in the beast that causes men to worship the first beast. Uh, Revelation 17, 9 through 12 tells us that the heads and horns are kings, while Revelation 16, 13 calls the second beast the false prophet. Both the lamb and the dragon then manifest their power through the, the political uh, kingdom, the child, the first beast, and the ecclesiastical kingdom, the woman, the second beast. Um, eventually, the Lamb's kingdom shall prevail when Christ shall stand on Mount Zion with the faithful who have been sealed by the powers that angelic, angelic ministration has restored to the earth. The triumph of Christ's kingdom will cause the downfall of Satan's kingdom. For another interlude that recounts the joy of those who are saved, similar to the first. Okay, <laughs> we're getting toward the end here. Uh, the book of Revelation shall be unfolded. If we diligent, if we diligent, <laughs> if we diligently use the keys that the Lord has given to us to interpret the book of Revelation, it can truly become a book of Revelation for us. As Moroni wrote, "Quote." And then, in the days when the Lord has restored the covenant, shall many shall my revelations, which I have caused to be written by my servant John, be unfolded in the eyes of all the people. Remember, when you see these things, ye shall know that the time is at hand, that they shall be made manifest in very deed. End quote. That's Ether 416. And that's how the article ends. And um, I'm going to be as bold as to say I do believe that we see this unfolding uh, in front of our eyes right now. I, I, re I really, really do. We, we know for a fact that some of it has because the woman has come back from the wilderness. The church has been restored. Um, and it does seem like a lot of things, like a lot of the judgments that are associated with the angels blowing their trumpets, the seven angels, it seems to be happening. So in the way, the way that the prophet and the apostles are talking right now, uh, it does give you the sense, I think, that the time is at hand. You know, President Nelson went so far as to say that time is running out in 2019. I don't know how you get more explicit than that. Okay, so that's it for this article. I really liked it. I think, I feel like this should be like required reading <laughs> for before anybody uh, reads the book of Revelation. This should be required reading. Um, not really. Okay, so I'm going to end it there. Uh, if you haven't already, please make sure to subscribe, like this video if you liked it. Uh, leave your thoughts and comments and uh, anything that stood out to you or anything that you have to add. And uh, make sure to share this. Share this with anyone that, you know, is always talking about Revelation and, and maybe doesn't... Um, you know, maybe takes things a little bit too literally, or um, or anyone that just wants to know more. You know, it's having a hard time understanding the Book of Revelation. I think this is a great, great place to start. Um, and I'll talk to you guys later.